Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, if I could choose only one work by Composer X, it would have to be work B. Well, Composer X today is William Walton, and really a surprising number of you have been plugging for Walton as this series has progressed, and I'm very impressed by that. It means he's got some fans, and he deserves some. He's not exactly au courant in the music world, after all, and he deserves to be because he was just a marvelous composer and a wonderful craftsman, and, and, and you know, like lots of geniuses, he was genial. I mean, he wrote great pieces, and the piece that you've recommended most frequently is the first symphony, which I really understand because it's a rugged, exciting piece full of piss and vinegar. I just love it. It's very Sibelian, actually, at least the opening with its chugga 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 string ostinatos. It's also very Waltonian, and it's just it's just one of the 20th century's great symphonies. However, some of you have also suggested that you prefer the second symphony, which is kind of a, you know, out of out of the gate or out of bounds recommendation because nobody likes the second as much as the first. But some of you do, and I think that's marvelous because it's also a wonderful piece. A little more elusive than the first, I think. The, the first has a very direct emotional trajectory, but there's also the viola concerto for people who prefer austerity. And, and the violin concerto for Heifetz, and there's Facade, and there's Belshazzar's Feast, which is the Carmina Burana of the English choral music scene. I mean, it's just great stuff. He was, he was terrific. So that's why I have chosen from this wonderful welter of possibilities, the Variations on a Theme by Hindemith from 1963-ish, his late masterpiece. It really is. And the reason I chose it is because remember always that the idea here is to choose the piece which is most characteristic or typical of the composer if all other works by him were to be destroyed by the evil god Cancrazans, who is annoyed with the classical music industry and wants to just preserve one work by each composer. Well, the reason the intimate variations qualify, first of all, is because it's fabulous and it's definitely one of the great variation works in the in the repertoire for orchestra. There are really, I mean, there's like Elgar's Enigmas and there's like the Dvorak Symphonic Variations and the Brahms Haydn Variations. You know, there's, there's not tons of them. And this is one of the absolute great one and probably the greatest written in the 20th century. It's just, it's just fantastic, or at least the second half of the 20th century. It's an amazing work. First of all, it's based on the slow movement of Hindemith's cello concerto, which is in itself a fabulous tune, an amazingly wonderful tune. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 the tune has so many things you can do. You know, a lot of the, the key to writing great variation pieces is how you pick them. <laughs> you got to choose the right tune. And this one was a great choice. First of all, it has a beautiful form. It's an ABA form. And, and, it, that, and within that ABA form, it has many motives and, and smaller phrases that you could work with when you're writing variations. For example, the opening phrase is da 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 ya da da ya da da and then comes the kicker wa da 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 ya da 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 that's sort of the opening phrase. That second phrase is one of Hindemith's most characteristic melodic shapes. It's the beginning of, of Das Marienleben. Da, 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 You know, was muss die Engel. It's, it's, it's that. And it's in the symphony in E flat. It's in all kinds of pieces that he wrote. It's one of his signatures, and it's in this theme. And it makes a wonderful sort of like tag. So no matter what happens around the different variations in terms of their 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 play on that first phrase, if if Walton preserves the shape of that second phrase, you know exactly where you are in the variations. Similarly, the middle section, it's it's a beautiful wandering sort of thing that morphs into a phrase that you hear in the finale of the Mattis der Mahler Symphony. That sort of passionate sigh. And and Walton makes a meal of it in the different variations, in the slower variations. So it's just it's just a work of genius. 
genius. And the reason that I think it doesn't get all the all the credit it deserves is because, well, you know, Walton, like I said, is not exactly au courant. And, and big 25-minute-long variation works, aside from Elgar's Enigmas, I mean, they, they don't get played that much. There's no reason it's not it's not more popular. And of course, the theme is by Hindemith, who himself is not au courant. You know, he's not that popular nowadays, although he should be. And it's one really fine composer's tribute to another. Hindemith was very impressed with the work, and Walton was very impressed by George Sell and the Cleveland Orchestra's performance of the work, which blew his mind. And, you know, the reason Walton didn't write much music, I think, and the reason he doesn't get played as much as he ought to is because he's a very particular composer. He was very, very picky, extremely picky. I mean, he wrote slowly and with great deliberation and incredible precision. I mean, I, I can show you in a simple example. I have here the critical edition here um, of the complete works. And if you look at just the fugue subject at the end of the variations, which is based on um, the main theme, of course, it's right here around page 200 and some odd billion and something here. Up oh, there we go. Um, I think that's up oh, there it is. I'm going to show you. It's just it's played by the second violins and the violas, the initial fugue subject. So here it is. Now that's the end. Okay, there it is. Okay. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Let me see if I can do this. There we go. Look at that. See that? With my head down here. Look at how much detail he writes into that single line of music. Look at the accents on almost every note, the staccati, the tenuti, the, the you know, every single note, the phrasing marks, the diminuendos, the crescendos, the dynamics, the sforzandi, and this is just one line of music. I mean, it's extraordinary how carefully and thoroughly these things get marked. Now, can anyone in real life play all that stuff at speed? Nah, not really. But it, it gives you a sense of what he's looking for. And so when he's got like, you know, full pages of stuff happening in here, which he quite frequently does, um, like, you know, like, like, oh, here's one, <laughs> you know, and everybody's going, and they all have that level of detail. And he really was that precise. Um, I think that's one of the things that Hindemith liked about him. Hindemith was also very precise. There's a craftsman-like attitude to their music. Um, whether or not you think it's the greatest or most expressive music in the universe isn't the point. In a sense, it's written at a level, and it never falls below that level. And Walton was one of those composers. Um, he would rather turn out quality than quantity in terms of the overall finish of his pieces. And the, the, the Intimate Variations, quite simply, is his most perfect work. It really is. And it's just so much fun to listen to. Give it a shot if you don't know it. There are nine variations. And the thing that's really cool about it is that the the odd variations slow down. The even variations speed up, um, you know, in alternating fashion. And, and then there's a big fugue finale at the end based on the Hindemith theme before it all comes back um, in its quasi-original form. And the last chord is absolutely gorgeous. You know, it's, it's for the brass, then the woodwinds, then the strings, you know, one after the other. It's, it's all such a beautiful exposition of what an orchestra can do in variation form. And the other thing to keep in mind when you listen to it is that the, the original theme is an A, B, A form, as I pointed out. But in the variations, Walton doesn't feel any obligation to stick to that. Quite a few of them are simply A and B. He doesn't repeat the A section at the end. So whether it does repeat or doesn't repeat, that allows him to vary the length of each variation within each tempo area and to create a very effective scheme of slow versus fast, of, of, of relaxation and, and tension. And the whole thing is, it's just perfectly worked out that way. It's, it's incredible. And that's why the choice for William Walton has to be his variations on a theme by Hindemith. And then go listen to Hindemith's cello concerto. You'll like that too. Oh, it's got great tunes. I can sing them all. So keep on listening, folks. I'll spare you that. Take care.